Good morning, wizards. How are you feeling? Excited. June Con too, you know. Good to be here. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, but for those of you who have not met, uh, my name is Tom Schmidt. I'm a general partner at Dragonfly for a global crypto venture fund. Uh, before Dragonfly, I was a uh, product manager at Instagram, uh, and then I led product at Zero X for a few years. And um, that's actually where I met the June guys, uh, ETH Berlin 2018. Uh, at Zero X, we were super into data, ended up talking data, not that many people doing crypto data back then. And so um, really impressed and, and just excited to see how far they've come. So today, um, I'm going to be talking through a little bit about um, data in uh, venture capital. And that kind of comes through a couple different lenses of how we use data in the venture process, trends in venture capital right now, and just general trends in the crypto industry that I'm really excited about. So um, we're going to be talking about what do VCs actually do, data, and uh, and eventually talking about some, some trends. So um, I feel like VCs are sort of this mysterious entity in crypto where if you're losing money, it's because of VCs. And if you're making money, it's also because of VCs. And somehow they're always doing something. And to be honest, that is true. Um, VCs really, you know, control the industry and we're this, you know, secret, you know, shadowy cabal of, of, of actors in the background. But um, in reality, it, it's actually not that complicated. Um, the first thing that we do is, maybe it's not, um, the first thing that we do is uh, we raise money from LPs. Uh, we invest those, uh, that money into uh, companies that have some sort of venture scale capability. Um, and then we help those companies be successful. And that that's kind of it at the end of the day. It's sort of finding the companies that you want to work with and then working with them. Um, I think this, this second part of finding companies that have venture scale is the part that gets a little bit confusing or maybe is a little unorthodox how you would normally thinking, be thinking about investing in your own portfolio. Um, when you think about investing in your own portfolio, you maybe think about building a diversified set of companies or investments and hey, hopefully on average, they go up over time. Investing in venture is very sort of counterintuitive. Um, you are going to lose money on the majority of the investments that you do. Most of your investments are going to return uh, 1x or less. This is a, um, some data from Correlation Ventures that has done some really nice work looking at venture returns um, in aggregate um, over the past decade or so. Um, and we can see that most companies are actually not going to return very much. But there's this very small percentage of companies, this 1% to 5%, that are going to return more than the fund um, or more. Um, and so you can see this over 20x is, is kind of where you actually find those. So if you think about your own portfolio, you know you don't expect most of your investments to go to zero. Um, but in, in venture, that's kind of the nature of the business. And so when we're looking at companies, we kind of have this mindset that, hey, we're making a lot of investments. Some of them are going to work out, but the majority are not going to. Um, the next step, help those companies succeed. Obviously, that means you're chilling at the beach, taking a call here and there, uh, being a cool VC as uh, all VCs are. Um, but you know, um, but you know, in reality, it, it is a lot more sort of uh, you know day-to-day -day bread and butter stuff. So um, for us, uh, that means product advice, introductions, coaching. Um, we have the illustrious Hill Dobby, who works with uh, some of our port portfolio companies on data. Um, we help companies with engineering. We help them with talent. It's a lot of sort of the you know general handholding and assistance that you would want at an early stage company, but just comes from your investor versus having it needing to have it all in house on day one. Um, so that's that's sort of how we think about using uh, uh, you know what VCs actually do when it comes to using data in the venture process. Again, data sort of comes in at every different step in the process, but it looks a little bit different at every stage. So if you think about sort of that pipeline, you're sourcing deals, you're finding companies that you might want to invest in. You're diligencing them and saying, hey, is this actually going to be a good investment? And then you're assisting them. So you're saying, hey, what are some comps? What are, you know, what are your financials look like? Um, how can we actually use the current data that your company is producing and find some interesting trends or insights that might be able to help you? Um, and I think of this not necessarily as discrete steps, but they're actually all very interrelated. Um, and it's sort of this nice and virtuous cycle. So to give an example, um, it's sort of this virtuous cycle of you're generating ideas, you're validating those ideas using data, you're looking top down at data in aggregate um, and looking for new ideas and looking for new areas to investigate. And then you're drilling down into, those, into those, those areas to generate new ideas. And so this all sort of comes in one big loop, but data sort of comes in at every single part. You're going from qualitative to quantitative and back. So to give an example, let's say you are working in venture and you're, you know, Gen Z junior analyst texts you and says, yo, 
Maestro is blowing up right now. Oh God, we got we got to invest in Maestro. And you're like, okay, but what what is Maestro? What are you talking about? Don't you have some actual work to be doing? Um, but then you know, okay, well, this is an interesting idea. Let's actually look at the data and see what's happening with this thing, Maestro. Maestro, for reference, is a uh, Telegram bot that lets you trade on Uniswap. So we would then go look at some of the data and say, okay, well, um, is this thing growing? What kind of you know uh, user count do they have? What's their retention look like? What does their revenue look like? Um, generally, get a sense of you know beyond sort of the the qualitative aspect of we think this is a cool product and we like the team quantitatively, how are they actually performing? And so we might go on Dune, look at some information about how Maestro is doing and say, okay, well, this is kind of interesting, but what's the larger context? Like this is one specific bot in one specific corner of the industry. How do they compare to their uh, competitors? How do they compare to other parts of the industry? And so then we would sort of zoom out and look top down and say, well, how are Uniswap Telegram bots doing overall? And and sort of put Maestro in this this bigger context of um, hey, what's actually going on in the industry? How can we sort of rationalize what this company is doing versus other companies in different parts of the industry or different parts of the segment? And so we maybe look at overall Telegram bots and, and sort of uh, look at, hey, what's actually going on in this category? And then we might say, well, you know, tele Telegram bots are really one part of the story when it comes to Uniswap trading. So where else are flows coming from? Where else is Dex volume coming from? And you might zoom out even more and you say, okay, um, what are you know, some interesting sources of volume for Uniswap bots? This is actually um, a great dash that um, Angela from Flashbots, I think is going to be talking about a little bit. So sorry for front running you. Um, but sort of a general breakdown of uh, uh, where flows on Uniswap are coming from to understand, okay, is this a growing market category? Is this a shrinking market category? Um, how do we sort of think about this? And you can say, oh, interesting. Um, you yeah, know, this looks great, but, um, Banana Gun is actually, you know, much larger share of, of this volume than, uh, or of the users than, than Maestro. So what's going on with Banana Gun and what are people actually trading? Um, and then we would say, well, what are people actually trading? And it looks like kind of a bunch of random coins. What's going on? With and so this isn't, you know, that's meant to be, uh, a, uh, you know, example that you should use for your own practices, more an example of how this sort of, um, back and forth happens. Um, um, with data in crypto, where we're looking at taking specific ideas, looking at data on those ideas. Sorry. Oh, no. Um, and then using, those, using that data to um, look for more venture capital trends. So um, that's sort of data overall. But I think maybe a good point would be to talk about how um, venture, what are current trends in venture capital as an asset class? Because obviously, venture capital is one type of asset people, there's different ways to actually invest money beyond venture capital, believe it or not. Um, and, and one way I like to think about this is sort of like the bull, bull whip effect, which you, if you heard this during COVID, um, was this idea that, um, uh, uh, hey, there's sort of this lag time between when one part of the uh, of demand um, or one part of supply um, is growing or shrinking and how that actually ripples through the rest of the economy. So in VC, that looks like um, you know, really the big macro driver here is interest rates. Interest rates changing impacts how LPs think about the risk appetite. Um, there we go. Impacts how LPs think about the risk appetite, which in turn impacts how, uh, how they think about, you know, investing into VCs, which in turn uh, impacts how uh, VCs think about investing into startups. And so um, for us, you know, we're really downstream of all of this where Hey, you might see you know different uh, um, startups getting invested into right now, but really that is sort of a lagging indicator of this overall interest in investing into venture capital, which is overall this um, sort of uh, downstream of this overall interest in investing in in VCs um, by LPs. And so, um, right now, you know, perhaps not surprising to anybody. Um, perhaps not surprising to anybody, um, VCs are really in, in, in a downturn right now, um, where um, VCs are, um, uh, sorry, um, are no noticeably having you know, remarkably you know, worse, worse returns than they have in the past few years. Um, so yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Um, are having are having worse returns than they've had in the past few years, and and we see this get reflected not just in you know sort of primary markets, um, but also in in secondary markets. Um, 
This is a uh, uh, data from Notice.co, which is this um, sort of secondaries market broker where you can buy and sell shares in pre-public companies um, with other investors. So if you want to go buy some shares in SpaceX or Stripe, um, you can go to Notice and um, they will find you a broker that will go and, and uh, uh, you know, sell you that. And so this is sort of their top 50 index. And you can sort of see, hey, even in the secondaries markets where people are trading you know, pre-public companies, it's not just... Um, uh, this sort of decline in, in seed funding, but overall, uh, um, you know, prices are down on secondary markets as well. Um, and naturally, that sort of gets reflected in um, um, in how venture actually gets deployed. So um, we can see that, um, hey, you know, despite this peak in 2021, um, people are still deploying and people are still investing, but uh, just the overall amounts are, that that are being deployed are going down. Um, and we also see that like uh, the the average check size is going down as well. One thing to keep in mind when you get data when you read about venture capital funding um, in you know the block or TechCrunch or whatever is that this is often delayed. So you'll often see you know data or you'll often see news reports that are coming out that are you know um, coming out from a year ago. And so um, the the data that you're seeing right now is not necessarily the freshest data. And so going back to sort of this lagging bull whip effect that I was talking about, we're sort of seeing hey. Uh, snapshots from a year or two ago that are now sort of being rippled through the rest of the industry. Um, um, and we sort of see this as well in terms of how, you know, money's actually being deployed. So, um, hey, uh, you know, if I'm thinking about sort of the risk-adjusted return of an, of investing in a given startup, um, most of that is, is uh, you, you, the later stage you're, in, you're doing an investment, um, you know, the less risky it should be, right? Like if I'm, if I'm writing a, you know, $200 million check, there should be more confidence that I'm going to be able to get, you know, a, a solid return on this is on this company versus an early stage. Um, hey, you know, we, we know there's a higher probability of, of failure. And so we're willing to sort of do less, less uh, um, uh, or take take on that risk. And then that's kind of where we see as well, where late stage has really sort of dried up, but early stage is still relatively thriving and, and still relatively uh, uh, popping um, simply as a result of, again, this sort of lag time in terms of how capital is sort of being deployed through the, the overall sort of capital deployment ecosystem. Um, and so maybe jumping into some more, some more specifics and more, more trends that we're seeing in the startup space overall, one, start, one trend that we see is this, this hunt for yield, quote unquote. And when I talk about yield, I'm not talking about yield farming. Um, I think that is uh, kind of a difficult uh, play, a difficult, difficult story right now. I'm talking about yield on uh, people's um, capital coming from uh, traditional sources of yield, such as treasuries. So um, people increasingly want yield for their cash, and they're willing to move around and hunt to go look for it. Um, this is some data uh, from Visible Alpha, which basically looks at the um, flow of uh, funds from large U.S. banks, um, from uh, um, accounts that have uh, little to no yield. Um, and when we can sort of see that this was you know, sort of again reflected in the banking crisis in the U.S. earlier this year, people are moving cash out of uh, accounts that have no yield and looking for yield um, elsewhere. If that's money market funds, if that's buying treasuries directly, that's moving to banks that have more competitive interest rates. So people are you know, act actively withdrawing funds from low interest rate savings accounts and looking for places to get additional yield. Um, crypto is not immune to this. Um, uh, um, crypto is not immune to this. We also see this in sort of the stablecoin market where, um, you know, there, there's various reasons that sort of go into why these things are growing or shrinking. Um, we saw obviously regulatory action against BUSD, which, you know, caused a lot of its strength and, and USDC as well. Um, but overall, stablecoin uh, uh, issuance has gone down substantially, um, which normally you would think would be super bearish for the industry. Hey, people are not issuing new stablecoins. Who's going to go buy some crypto for me? Um, but in fact, if you zoom in a little bit more, um, you can see that there actually is a, um, a, a section of this market that's, that's outperforming and actually growing, which are um, yield-bearing asset teams. Um, yield-bearing assets have been growing um, you know, pretty much um, up only for the past year or so. Um, again, reflecting this overall trend in the U.S. banking um, uh, system, where people are moving out of low interest rate uh, uh, savings accounts to new to new accounts to find yield that is actually going to uh, 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 you know pay them the risk that they that they deserve. And so, this is probably not surprising um, when you when you sort of think about what's going on in macro right now. But um, it, it's it's interesting to see how tightly coupled um, the, the crypto ecosystem is. Um, with actual traditional finance. Uh, 
The other trend I think that has been, you know, making buzz in the past, let's say a few months, has been this idea of crypto social. Crypto social has been around for a long time. Um, there's been status, you know, since the early days. There's even been, you know, federated uh, uh, ecosystems like Mastodon that's been around for a while. Uh, but now all of a sudden, people are like, hey, let's invest in crypto. Let's invest in social because French tech has been saying and French tech seems to be doing well. And so as if you see, you might see some of these charts around, um, hey, number of transactions or number of users, you might say, oh, uh, you know, this looks amazing. Or you might see some some data from Farcaster, and you might say, "Oh, this looks even you know better." I'm I'm really really excited about investing into social. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it looks it looks amazing. Yeah, great. I, I as a VC, I'm I'm you know diligent in this this deal, and I'm really excited about it. Um, or you might you know look at something like Lens, and you say, "Oh my God, you know, okay, I don't know why this is so very." <laughs> I don't know what's happening with the, uh, there you go. Um, but I, you know, I think unfortunately, uh, looking when you're diligent a deal, looking at the right data is, is often more important than just looking at some data and period. And so for, for something like social, really the gold standard is retention. Um, retention is, is, uh, essential because if you don't have good retention, you're going to lose all of your users at some point. Um, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but we can sort of see that, Hey, for a lot of these crypto social apps, you know, retention is actually not flatlining. Retention is going down um, for every single cohort week over week or month over month. Um, and what this means is that, hey, at some point, you know, these applications are going to run out of users because every new user that enters the ecosystem is eventually going to um, uh, fall out. And so we, in, in, in social, we call this the leaky bucket theory, uh, meaning that, uh, hey, if you're putting water into a bucket and there are holes in it, you, you can fill up the bucket as much as you want. But at some point, all that water is going to be gone because uh, you know, it's all going to be drain, draining out of it. So um, it's important when you're looking at, when you're also diligent in deals to um, be looking at retention, which is, which is, again, is kind of this gold standard. If you don't have something that's sticky, um, it's just not going to um, eventually result in, in a company that's going to last. Um, last sort of trend that uh, I've been looking at that I'm excited about is this idea of uh, sort of the, the changing way that order flow happens in, in, in crypto. Um, you may recognize uh, this MEV supply chain pick. Um, this is from Stefan, who used to be at uh, Flashbot, sort of talking about this idea of the MEV supply chain of how transactions actually get routed and, and confirmed on chain. So here we're going from um, users to wallets, uh, to searchers, to builders, to validators. This is conventionally how people sort of think about how a transaction actually gets confirmed. You, you sign it, you send it um, you know, off to the mempool, a searcher finds it, they include a bundle, it gets validated. Um, but I, I think this is a bit simplistic and a, and a bit outdated. Um, and in fact, we, we can also validate this idea through data. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that this is actually not, not necessarily correct. And um, the reason why this is not necessarily correct is because this idea that, hey, transactions are gonna hit the public mempool is increasingly actually not correct either. Um, I actually had. Um, this is uh, um, also some some data. This is from um, Tony Warshutter. He's at the uh, EF, um, and he, he's launching this this great website, mempool.pix, which I highly, highly recommend everyone to check out. Um, basically trying to look at the difference between what are transactions that actually get confirmed on chain versus transactions that we actually see in the public mempool. The idea being that, hey, if we're seeing transactions land on chain, that have never entered the public mempool, but most likely got confirmed through some sort of private mempool or some sort of private means. Um, and so this is some data from most of the top builders um, on Ethereum. Where we're gonna see that um, actually, you know, double digit percentage of their uh, um, order flow is not even being seen in the public mempool before it gets confirmed on chain. Um, there's a great time series, which I uh, did not put in the deck in time for this presentation. I highly recommend go everyone check it out. Um, basically in the past year, we've gone from um, four or 5% of all transactions um, entering the public mempool to now at 12% and growing. And so when we think about investable opportunities for, for, uh, for venture, we think about, Hey, what are sort of trends that are currently happening that we can sort of surf on top of and sit on top of versus, um, trying to necessarily go against where the market is going. It's much easier to sort of identify those trends early, um, and then sit on top of them. Um, so, um, I apologize for the, uh, yeah, the interruptions, but I hope this gives sort of a good overview of, of how we think about data in the venture process, as well as, um, current state of the venture market and uh, some potential uh, investable opportunities for us going forward. So uh, that's uh, data and venture.